Thanks so much for coming. My name is Jen Krava. I'm Director of Programming and New Initiatives at Forecast Public Art. We are a 41-year-old public art nonprofit that's based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, we do a variety of things. One is consulting work, so we help people find artists and make public art and placemaking projects happen. We also offer a program um, where we give grants to artists who are based in Minnesota. So if you're an artist, um, either emerging or mid-career, we have grants that will open in uh, September. So watch for those um, to do either projects or research and development or professional development activities. And then we also do public programming like this, where we talk about public art and what it means. So tonight we're talking about performance and public art with a wonderful array of artists who have all done projects here at the Weissman. So thanks so much for coming. Um, feel free to stick around after if you want to talk more about Forecast. I'm going to hand it to Morris. Hello, everyone. I'll, I'm doing the institutional part, so I'll just stand. <laughs> does this one work? Yeah, it does. Welcome, everyone. As always, I would like to begin by acknowledging the land we are on, which is the homeland of the Dakota people. Welcome to the Weisman Art Museum. I am Boris Oekerman. I am the Cindy and Jay Ilenfeld Curator for Creative Collaboration. Uh, this is a two-part event. There will be introductions by artists, and then there will be Q&A and discussion. Uh, you can ask questions and make comments in two ways. You can do it old-fashioned way, doing this, and we'll have mic to you, or you can log in into that website, into Slido, and all the instructions are there. You just go to that website on your phone, uh, put in that code Y669, and start asking questions or commenting. We are not moderating that list, so whatever you input and you hit send, it gets there directly. Just. Um, oh, and you can also like questions. Uh, so if you like a question, it goes up the queue. After this panel, we invite you to share some delicious food with us, courtesy of the Breaking Bread and the Appetite for Change, a community based on profit using food as a tool to build health, wealth, and social change. The reception will be followed by a music performance that was created especially for tonight. So please stick around. I would like to thank the voters of Minnesota for supporting the operational budget of this museum through Minnesota State's Art Board, the Wells Fargo Foundation also for supporting our operational budget, the Target Foundation for funding the construction of the studio that I curate, the Target Studio for Creative Collaboration. Our panelists today are all fellows at the Target Studio, and I would like to thank the organizations that supported them, uh, Forecast Public Art, for supporting a Nietzsche Art Project 1 of 30 through the Mid Career Professional Development Grant awarded to Pramila Vasudevan, the Stardust Fund and the Puffin Foundation for supporting Monica Sheets' work on her project, The Feminist Strip Club, which you could uh, see just before this panel. Uh, Monica is also the recent recipient of a Blade of Grass Fellowship for Socially Engaged Art that will support the continued development of this project. So I would like to thank a blade of grass and congratulations to Monica. Thank you to Stardust Fund for supporting also Nushin Hakim and Pedro Baldari's work on the project Radio Rism. Thank you to the Medical School of the University of Minnesota for supporting Pong Wu um, in his project The Archive of Sleeplessness. And thank you for Forca to Forecast Public Art for co-organizing this event with us. Thank you to our panelists and thank you all for being here. This panel is a part of a series of events today that concludes the first year of the new, new program for creative collaboration at the Wiseman. This was one of the most exciting and intense years in my life. This program went live last summer and picked up an incredible pace. Uh, there were, since last summer, there were 15 new initiatives that involved more than 20 artists and indirectly involving many more, uh, working in nearly as many different kinds of creative practices, building relationships with scholars from all walks of humanities and sciences, and dealing with wide spectrum of topics ranging from criminal justice, immigration, and women's right, rights to embodied cognition, space travel, and sleep. 
If you ever had a conversation with me about art and curating, you'll know that I'm a fan of emerging, emergent processes, where things arise out of interactions and relationships, as opposed to being planned and executed. In her book, Emergent Strategy, Adrienne Marie Brown compiled a list of principles for emer of emergence, one of which reads, move at the speed of trust. Judging by the speed with which the program at the Target Studio have developed, the amount of trust that we have received is truly incredible. I would like to thank everyone who trusted us over the last past years. And first of all, the artists fellows of the program, Olive Buringa, Otto Ramstad, Liza Sylvester, Danny McCarthy Clifford, Marcus Young, Pramila Sudovan, Rachel Jandrzejewski, Terry Hamfling, Monica Sheets, Nushin Hakim, Pedro Baldari, Molly Parker Stewart, Shanai Madison, Pong Wu, Anna Marie Shrogan, Yugo Tonikuchi, and Alison Hiltner. The subject of our conversation today is performance and public art. This panel represents a very diverse, very diverse set of practices of performance. Pramila and Anicha Art are known for their large scale choreography in public spaces. Pong is a part of artist collaborative Carry On Home, which creates communal platforms for making personal experiences public. Nushin and Pedram create a radio station that will broadcast, broadcast interviews, stories, and sound performances. Monica Sheets make, makes public the social and economic conditions of performance practice that is hidden from the public eye, that is, of erotic dance and strip clubs. But there is an additional level of public performance that is common to all the projects that happen at the Target Studio. The creative research the artists conduct is always public. Whether artists work at the Target Studio or meet researchers and students on campus, the creative process is exposed, so the entire fellowship can be seen as a performance in public space. In preparation for this panel, we asked artists to reflect on, this, reflect on this process and share with us what effect does this public exposure do to your creative process and what result does it have on your product? Does this experience change the way you think about your future work? And finally, if you were to do a thousand year long project, public art project, and have no restrictions of any kind, what would that project be? What would be the role of public in it? What would be the role of art museums in it? Without further ado, let's get on with it. So we introduce our project. Okay. Uh, so my name is Peng Wu. So I'm known as a sleep artist who uh, sucks at sleep. <laughs> so um, could you raise your hand if you don't sleep well? See? So sleep is a social problem. And the WHO World Health Organization has defined, um, has announced the sleep as a uh, epidemic, epidemic, like global, in most developed country. So uh, that's kind of uh, the social background context my project is. Uh, so I've been working collaborating with my collaborator, Michael Howell. He's a, a neurologist and sleep uh, researcher in medical school in the past almost a year. So uh, a lot of ideas kind of comes from the conversation between me and him, and uh, also comes from my weekly uh, attendance at the uh, sleep center at the HCMC hospital. So, uh, so the entire project comes from my personal issue first. Uh, I don't sleep well, so uh, as many artists, we want to use our art to solve problems. So I'm thinking maybe uh, my project can solve my sleep issue. So, so the entire project comes from uh, started as an uh, investigation in and re, re, reconsidering the sleep therapy to look at all those um, things people can do to sleep better. Uh, I think one of the like kind of breaking point in my project is uh, uh, from my collaborator's uh, presentation. Uh, he said like one sentence that's really like shocked me completely. Uh, he said, based on all scientific research, knowledge transfer based sleep therapy is as effective as pharmacological therapy. So, which means in the scientist community, in the medical science community, it's already a like proven fact that all 
what you can learn, the knowledge you absorb can change your sleep more, like as good as all the pills on the market. And actually, when I was attending the last sleep center meeting, I don't know if I should say this. So the FDA just uh, sent an internal warning to all the doctors, says all the, a lot of prescription, I probably should say, <laughs> all the pres prescription pills is killing people. So people like sleep drive, sleep walk, and got killed because they take pills. Uh, so, so I was thinking how knowledge about sleep can be more, effecti more effectively transferred to the public at lower cost. You know, every knowledge transferred in the clinic is extremely expensive, right? I don't have great like health insurance. So we were, so my idea is maybe we can use participatory art uh, project like to somehow transfer those knowledge through rituals, through activity we do together. So yeah, that's one of the big direction where I'm working on. And another interesting direction that's come out, out of nowhere is I just recently found that, uh, so when people are in different posture and the environment, people talk differently. So I found that when people are laying down and talk to each other, they speak more honestly, they speak more sincerely and intimately. So I was thinking maybe sleep can be a tool to actually have people who have different opinions talk to each other, then different, completely different things may happen. That's one idea. Another idea I'm thinking, so it ties to my passion in the public art of bringing people together. Yeah. Can you a thousand years, please? A thousand years, probably? I can lay down. So you ask me the same question, and I can answer you. When I'm laying down, different jet posture, I may talk differently and have a different idea. Could you ask again? <laughs> I think I think I would try to find uh, my uh, sleep partner <laughs> through my public art project so I become lonely in bed and sleep better <laughs> See, I think completely differently. I don't think, lo think logically and talk logically, right? I'm sharing the most intimate thoughts of mine in this intimating public <laughs> situation. Right? Okay, I think I talk too much. Hello, does this work? Yeah, okay. Um, Pramila, um, thank you, Boris and Jen, for doing this, and all the staff and everyone in this building. And thank you for your thank yous. That was really detailed, and I, I was grateful for that. Um, and to all the artists, so cool. <laughs> um, the people uh, on on our on the team that was working was um, Max. Uh, there's Chitra Vairavan, Leela Peer, Sam Johnson, um, Valerie Oliviero. Am I missing someone? Did I say six people? Yeah, so six of us um, uh, that were on the team. And Boris had asked um, me if I would work with, uh, go talk with t uh, Professor Thomas uh, Stoffregen in the kinesiology department. And uh, he thinks about coordination dynamics um, and at its most reduced <laughs> in its most reduced understanding, it's about the way the body responds to uh, <laughs> sensory inputs. <laughs> could be visual, could be auditory. <laughs> I'm not good at talking in the mic. Okay. Uh, um, so, uh, so, we, uh, so Max will go into further details about some of the things that we uh, created and did, but... Um, some of the elements that I was really interested in, in thinking about uh, with the group, and you know, it was a we're 
all of the people are makers and were contributor, co contributors to the ideas and the direction of, um, of, of the projects. Um, and uh, we were really thinking about uh, the impulses, the, at least we started out thinking about the fraction of a second physical impulse in response to um, a sensory input. Um, in, for example, in Tom's uh, uh, lab, he has three walls and a ceiling, which if it um, moves towards you, you tend to move away, or if it moves away from you, you tend to move towards it. And that fraction of a second impulse is what we, were, we started out thinking about as uh, movers and, and choreographers and makers in the room. Um, and that's sort of how uh, the, the project sort of got developed. All of the rehearsals, everything happened in the studio, uh, Target studio, and, but I would say that not everything is public because the processes that go on in our minds when we leave the room, it doesn't stop when we exit. It, it, continually evolves and and so I would say that not every aspect is public <laughs> there's a little bit of uh, levels of, of boundaries that are revealed and um, the legibility is also not always there when you're at the beginning of a process of research and so um, so I, I, that would be my thing and I would also say that um, this notion of a thousand year project, um, our whole group talked about it for like, I don't know, lots of minutes. And, um, <laughs> and we, decide, we decided not to answer the question. <laughs> so we're just rebelling. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Max. Um, I, I worked as a, some sort of a creative collaborator with Pramila on the Unich Arts project. Um, we initially met with uh, Dr. Stoffregen uh, and, and talked about coordination dynamics and, and over the course of our first meetings with him, um, there were some, some parameters or qualities or um, concepts within his research that emerged and seemed uh, available in some way for choreographic extension or, or Im improvisational extension in, in this other context, in this like creative context here. Um, one of the things I noticed initially within his research is that a lot of it seems to be dependent on some very small, very difficult to detect qualities about um, the, the basal sway of a body, um, standing or sitting or laying down, there's some motion, some motion present always. And the, the bandwidth of that emotion, motion is about an inch. You're, you're moving you know, within this one inch circle just a little bit all the time. And uh, one of the, the qualities of his research was to examine that sway and, and look at it in terms of before and after in, in the context of events that might disrupt your physical equilibrium, such as motion sickness um, or, or flight or, or whatever it is. Um, so. That, that sort of uh, jumps right out in, in, a, in a sort of classical visual art way. It's like there's, there's a difficult to see thing here. How do we emphasize this and make this visible? And it, it, one of the initial steps in the project was to build some kind of mechanical elements that help us do that, help us um, show some of that motion so that we can have a kind of feedback loop relationship with it visually and work with it. Um, so we ended up making two pieces of equipment. You'll see them in this, um, in this slideshow uh, from time to time. One was a kind of hanging steel square that hung from the, the gallery ceiling for quite some time. And it had a, a, a lightweight plastic sheet dangling from it. And there was another object that was a, a, a kinematic kind of double skateboard, like a cross between two skateboards and a clock. And two, <laughs> two performers could occupy it at once and uh, have kind of uh, agonistic or game-like interactions with one another and, and sense one another's sway and so on and so forth. Um, it's difficult to synthesize what arrived in the, what you might call the research context of this work based on the inclusion of these objects. Um, however, I would say that because of the way we, we, we installed and deinstalled de some equipment every time we rehearsed, and we changed it frequently, and there was constant change in the positioning of these objects in relation to the conceptual 
uh, subject matter that we were working with. And it strikes me that, that that change or that repositioning, conceptual repositioning, changes in perspective, have something to say about the parallelism between the artistic work in this program and the scientific work that we refer to in our work. I don't know what exactly that is, but it's an interesting thought about um, experimental equipment and what is the difference with, with what we're using. Uh, I think that's all I have, so. Thank you. Those questions are awesome. Microphones are plenty. Um, so I'm Monica Sheets, and my artwork, uh, for the most part these days, is kind of inherently public in the sense that I'm very interested in working directly with the public as participants. Um, and I'm particularly interested in working with people who would not identify as activists, but still have this desire to feel uh, politically engaged in the sense of having an impact on the structures and politics that affect their lives. Um, and this very much comes from my own experience. I don't identify as an activist. Um, I'm also very um, suspicious, maybe too strong of a word, but I'll just use it, suspicious toward group activities in general. Um, like I've not necessarily had positive experiences with those in the past. And so a lot of my motivation is what are group structures that can work for people like me who don't, know, don't normally want to participate with groups and who maybe um, even if they, whether it's they identify as intro introvert or if they just, you know, um, don't necessarily come from an organizing background or a very community oriented background or communal kind of background, you know, how can they also be involved in these things and how can they also have that sense of, let's say, multiplying their effort that you get from multiple people working together. Um, and so with this project, uh, which is really for me a project that I've been waiting 30 years to do. <laughs> Um, and feel like finally that I have built up the skills to do this. Um, I am working with uh, women who are dancing, erotic dancers in strip clubs in Minneapolis, and to really, on the first level, work as a group ourselves to talk about what are the issues that we see as most important, um, what are the uh, you know, labor issues, what are the gender issues, all of these sorts of things. Um, and then how do we want to bring that to the public? So I usually work in a fairly open way where I'm not necessarily saying from the very beginning, this is what we're going to do at the end, that I want the work to be uh, an evolving thing that comes from the interaction of the group itself. Um, and so that's my answer to the thousand year project thing too, is that the way I would involve the public is, you know, basically trying to bring them into the process as early as possible to help shape that process and help, you know, have them saying, these are the directions we want it to go. These are the things that we need to get out of it. And it being about, dealing with those different uh, conflicting desires and, you know, different goals and things like that, that uh, in different levels of, I would say, commitment to and different levels of participation that you have in a group um, and trying to make space for all of those different levels of participation as well, because some people have more time, some people have less time, some people want to engage on this level, some people want to engage on another level. Um, yeah, and I think I don't know. I think that's all I have to say right now. Hi, my name is Pedram Baldari. I'm collaborating on this uh, Radio Rhizome project with Nushin. Um, and the, the introduction of the Radio Rhizom is basically when we started um, based on um, the, the sort of content of some of our um, collaborative work, which is about this um, exploring displacement, the, 
the issues of, or basically immigration and, and uh, as well as identifying yourself as part of a, a, a new or uh, a place that you arrive at and the processes of that uh, psychologically, politically, and um, economically. Um, so Boris suggested working with the Center for New Americans uh, from the University of uh, Minnesota School of Law. It's, a, it's an immigration clinic um, and Depender uh, who is uh, who is the, uh, the director of the center? Uh, he's our collaborator, and also he's a pra practicing immigration lawyer, um, and also um, um, the coordinator of ACLU, the the basically human rights uh, association of uh, lawyers. Um, the coordinator from uh, uh, Minnesota, um, Julio, was also a, a, a person that we later started working with as our collaborator. Um, so yeah. we, uh, hello everyone, thanks very much for being here and thank you Boris for uh, connecting us with a really amazing group of lawyers. Uh, that uh, they've helped us to expose ourselves to so many questions that we had and we would always get those information from medias that we didn't know how much of it we should believe and how much of it is under the surface that we don't know about it. Uh, I think uh, when we started our collaboration with Depender and uh, the new center for being there, being your center for new Americans, we didn't know what expectation we should have. Uh, because that was a completely new field for both of us. Um, and what happened was that we had several meetings, and in meetings there were so many conversations that the more we go deeper into that, we would understand that we cannot expose those information. Uh, and there were so many research that we were doing that it wouldn't end up anywhere for like our art. Uh, so for the collaboration, basically, not for the art. <laughs> And so what happened was that uh, we went to workshops with law students and uh, we got trained uh, to go to the clinic that they would have for uh, immigrants in rural Minnesota. They have free clinics, free law clinics for uh, different pockets of immigrants in rural Minnesota that they would help them with their um, immigration case and tell them that if there is any chance for them to basically get an immigration or if they don't have any chance so that it's better to like have some plan B, they educate them what is their right when ICE attacks and uh, not attacks, ICE <laughs> comes, <laughs> whatever. Mostly attacks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> seriously, it's, yeah. It, I, yeah, I still would rather to call it attacks. So um, what we ended up uh, starting was that we, at the beginning, was not at the beginning, in the middle of the process, uh, we realized that lots of e these information, it's either illegal to share or we had moral problem with them to share. So we ended up thinking about a really simple way of communication to not to put the other part, part of, basically to not to put the public in danger, which uh, that way for us was making a radio. Uh, so the radio function in two different places. Uh, the first place is in St. James, that uh, basically with the program that we are developing, we are helping them to, un uh, to understand when ICE is actually attacking there and when it's the rumor, yeah, attack. <laughs> and then the second part of it is basically in University of Minnesota, which, you know, the public that we deal with them, they are completely different when you're from a a uh, really low income immigration illegal person in St. James, the content that we are basically working with that is so different than like some uh, student and faculty in University of Minnesota. So in University of Minnesota, we are thinking about different way of developing this project. For example, one of the things that's recently really 
um, is interesting for us is the whole conversation that happening around the uh, Kaufman and the names and we are trying to kind of like um, talk with people around this conversation and basically make some programs to put their radios in the Kaufman and broadcast it there to explo um, expose people that they live here with issues that it's about this community. I, I think one of those are really good questions. Do you want to yeah. Well, in regard with the uh, question of public or how do we work with public, I think uh, there is this assumption that there is an ideal public or there is a public that you, in but there are so many different publics. Um, and and then how to work with pub publics or groups of people depends on a lot of things. For the first time, um, you know, we 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 were practicing or we were practicing artists in Iran, and there is a lot of restrictions on how you make your own art, right? And and so, and the idea of like freedom of thought or freedom of speech and how that's conducted. So we were exposed to these a lot of these legal issues, for, but from the point of view of an artist who wanted to say what the artist wanted to say, and do it as 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 as, as safe as possible, right? Um, however, here we, for the first time we were we were exposed not only to that specific type of publics but but laws. We were working with lawyers. The content that is shared is not easy to to just come to a program and name such and such people with with this issue at the court because those are a lot of sensitive material. The case hasn't been closed. Even cases that are closed, they can be reopened. When we talked, actually, we were like, okay, we want to work on the cases that are, that are closed. And then we realized, they tell us, no, this current administration is spending 80, I don't know, $200 million on like reopening, uh, you know, uh, citizen cases that people who have gone through all the processes to become citizenship and how to find ways to revoke it. So, so that's why instantly our, our work be became split. One part, what we can do with the public that would never mostly come to this institution or th the, even this part of the city. And then on the other hand, and so we took different strategies of what is more appropriate there, what is, and, and how to navigate that. Uh, in terms of uh, understanding the public, I think I answered that. But, uh, but the, w w another part of it is how to present a work in an institution such as Wiseman, right? Um, Wiseman, uh, we we sort of started uh, letting Boris know that we may just broadcast something that you don't you don't like it, or you, but it's none of your business. <laughs> basically. I'm fine with that. <laughs> Because it's it's the, the it's our radio, you know, and we're broadcasting it. So, so, and th that was also another. So, how we can get away from w what can be present here? It, because of the radio, it could be anonymous. It could be whatever, and it it doesn't need. It does. It goes beyond the walls of the museum. So, sort of also plan to sort of undermine or reposition ourselves in terms of power in a smart way. But you're sort of thinking about publics as people, also as policies maybe, and transmission. 
curious how other people are thinking about the public and what that means to me. Like the public. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? No? You're thinking about publics as people, as maybe policy, and maybe as like modes of transmission, right? So I'm curious how, how our other artists are maybe thinking about publics and what that means and um, how you navigate all of those different publics within your works. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I guess I always think of there, I mean, I certainly think of there as being multiple pu publics even within the project itself, regardless of just the concept of there are multiple publics in the world, um, because there is the public with whom I'm collaborating that I have a particular relationship with, um, and then whatever project it's, it is that we are working on, generally there's the idea that we're going to bring that to yet another public at some point. Um, and so in this case with the dancers, like one of those questions is, you know, as we're working on this, like who do we want to address? You know, it's like, do we want to address other dancers? Do we want to address patrons? Do we want to address the general public? Um, you know, do we want to target policy makers, you know, so these are all like these potential publics uh, and of course in the ideal project in kind of with the ideal timeline and funding and everything, you would address all of these I think as well, I mean at least for me, um, but it's also a process of steps and what's logical and again like what the desires of the group are um, and I think um, you know, in, in basically to deciding like once, I mean, at least for me, the way I work, I'm thinking first about who that public is and what it is, how do we want to engage them, what's the topic we want to engage them on, and, you know, do we want to, again, make this a yet another level of participation, or is it more didactic or whatever, and depending on that, that's going to in large part determine the form of the work. Um, so working much more from this direction of the content and the audience rather than saying that I'm dedicated to a particular art form. Are there any verbal questions? I have a question. What are your... What? Thank you. Um, what are your inspirations for your artworks? Thanks. Um, for us, I think Tom started chatting with me and then he's like, you want to talk to Tom? <laughs> and so through that conversation, which wasn't a natural, organic, I mean, it, it definitely started out clunky. Um, and uh, it took a little help from an interpreter called, named Max <laughs> to help us navigate the conversation and to bring ease and to to for me to be able to find um, find what would be exciting for me um, as a choreographer working with the material um, that Professor Tom was engaged with and how to bring that into a creative practice um, and you know that was sort of the research and so the impulse to think about a fraction of a second is not something I'd ever thought about before. Not that I was able to necessarily capture that through the experimentation so far um, with the other group, but um, I mean, it, it, it takes it into consideration and that's how the worlds were built. Um, but um, that idea of, of this impulse and creating choreography from that, that that um, fraction of a second wasn't something that I was used to in, in a traditional dance platform. Or, um, and even, even though we have built projects that are durational or large scale that you know, are eight hours long or whatever, even that doesn't capture that fraction of a second. And, and it's been quite challenging um, to find depth and to find uh, a generative content to, 
to work with from from that that um, that uh, uh, framing. And so we've had to really push and find other elements and other ways of really finding depth and meaning within the coordination dynamics um, uh, world. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, I think there was a good question about public. I think I want to talk a little bit more about that. And that's kind of uh, leads to where my inspiration comes from. <sighs> so I think I just want to talk about the public through my own personal experience. So I grew up in China, and I feel there was so little, like so little public life in China in the past 40, 30 years because the, the, the government is constantly like monitoring the public space because they are worried that anything happening in public that people can connect with each other would threaten their uh, dictatorship, basically. So in order to remove this threat, they basically um, kind of banned or any kind of form of public gathering in the public space. So there were like almost like tiny little like public space, public life in my experience, life experience. So when I, so when I came here to United States for study at graduate school, um, I got the chance to work um, on a few projects at Northern Park. So that was like my first like drug I tasted of public, what public could be, how strangers show their best side of their humanity to each other, to strangers. So it's like, I was like, it was a shocking experience to me and I completely like remember that feel. So my, in my like past few years work is all about how we can use pu public space to connect people, to get people to talk to each other, to, um, uh, form this like bonding experience with another human being. Um, so I think then I get to, so then it's come to the question about inspiration. So among all like tools that you can use to connect with people, you know, it's a, it, the shared experience is a, like really a great tool to connect people if I have, we talk about if you have cat, I have cat, we talk about cat, and we kind of bond with each other, right? So share the emotion, share the experience. Then I found, you know, and uh, there's uh, so little experience stronger than pain in your life that actually can be used as a tool to connect with people. So that's how my like sleep project comes initially come up. So I was thinking, oh, like all those like painful hours of like laying awake in your bed, staring at the ceiling. Can that experience be like used to connect with people? Like, so that's how like this entire project, the inspiration comes from initially. But then it comes, it goes to everywhere, like through millions of conversation with doctors. Um, with psychologists, neurologists, and it's just, uh, yeah. And basically, I think later afterwards, a lot of conversation, uh, like inspiration comes from conversations with them. I feel like I can't come up with any good idea if I'm just sitting alone in my home. I just come up with idea when I talk with people, either from what they say or from what I told them. Because when you tell people, you force your brain to work differently to clarify what you're thinking. So that's, I think that's where my inspiration comes from. The top question is how are the artists defining public space? And I feel like I want to split it into two. How artists are defining public space and how artists can define public space if they're allowed to do whatever they want if they had the freedom and they know no restrictions, institutional financial that they have at the moment. So kind of what is the potential of art in defining public space? Um, I'm gonna start from an example. Mm. 
one day in the in the in in the art school in University of Tehran, um, the the um, the pollution that day was so crazy to the point that we were like tearing out. And our university is located in the very like you know heavy traffic part. And then we decided the art the art students to throw a picnic on uh, the craziest or busiest street in Tehran. Just go with watermelons and picnic things and just do it and disrupt, disrupt the flow. We didn't get arrested. That was interesting. You know, because the people, the pol police didn't have a code for that. Not because they were nice. <laughs> right? But that street, uh, the University of Tehran streets, is a very famous and, and loaded public space. It's full of bookstores, bookstores that often get closed because of the type of publications they may have, the books they may bring. Also is where most of the students assemble if there is a, um, if there is a strike, if there is a demonstration if it is just a loaded environment a lot of things happen so how and and the public space has been defined by the practice of the people even if it creates a lot of pressure they may even go to prison for practicing the 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 the, the basically the server the sovereignty of a person to belong to a public space. Sovereignty. Sovereignty? Sovereignty. Uh, so, in, in architecture, I studied architecture and we actually um, talked about a lot of what is public space. Public space mostly is defined, at least based on my knowledge and research, is a self-governed space. It doesn't need protection or, or a, an authority to run it. It's people's run. So when we talk about public spaces, we have to think or rethink how these public spaces are being run. Who runs them? Who creates opportunity for whom? But what systems? And, and, and these are a lot of questions an artist could ask. But I think mostly the artist's job in each project that you do with public is redefining what do you, the things that you find in public or things that you are interested in working with public. It doesn't, sometimes it's an experiment. You know, artists should be also allowed to make mistakes or do, do you, you, you calculate a lot of things to do a public work and something happens last minute and doesn't work out. And that's a part of it, I think. So. That's, that's as far as I could. They are really interesting. Oh, go ahead. You want to go? You, I mean, to okay. <laughs> um, I think, thanks very much for the questions. They are really interesting questions. Uh, I'm specifically interested in the second question right now. I mean, they have both three likes, so I can answer to that. <laughs> um, that's a big question uh, in art that as artists, are we allowed to represent other people or not? Uh, I think it's kind of connected to the other question that was uh, in there about the power structure and the authority of institution and artists and public. Uh, personally, I think as an artist, for my artwork, I don't see, um, I don't think that I am allowed to represent somebody else. And that's not the question that I ask in my artwork. Um, and um, 
The other thing is that like we as an artist, lots of time we talk about the power structure and the power of the institution. But I also think that as an artist that we represent in gallery, in public space, in wherever we present our work, we also are part of that power hierarchy and we have power over the audience. Like when you have the chance to put your sculpture somewhere or like performance, do a performance somewhere. Uh, I think we also have that power. So the question for me is to how to use that power. Like if I have a power that I can have the radio, what's gonna be the content that I'm gonna uh, broadcast there? Am I going to use it, use that power like the media power? Or am I going to use it in a different way? These are all the questions that I have to answer as an artist uh, for my own practice. Um, and I don't think that the question, like, mm, it's not about public or question, like, it's not a binary system. As an artist, we start with question, we, I start with prompt, and then I do research, and sometimes I don't even get the answer that I want, but that's part of the process for me. I mean, I was going to say, in terms of this question of public space, it's also, you have, you know, you can think of it as a physical thing, as a geographic place or whatever, um, but I think that for most of us, you know, we're seeing the public as something that, the public space is something that's being constituted in the process of our work when people are coming together. Um, you know, that's that, um, that it's, and you were, you know, like when you talk about the picnic, you know, it's like you have this street that's a public space by virtue of being a street that's accessible to all, you know, it's, you know, it, it, it obviously falls under, you know, some kind of regulation, governmental regulation, um, but it's a place that's accessible to virtually anyone. But when you go there and you do that action that you have that picnic, you're creating a different kind of public space and you're, you know, you're enacting this, you know, your role as a citizen or, you know, your role as um, a person in the world and that it's that interaction that's creating the public space. And I think that a lot of us, a lot of us are interested in both of those things and how they interplay with each other and how they play off of each other. And so that we're thinking about, you know, both the idea of public and the idea of public space in different ways. I mean, I think in terms of being in the Wiseman, um, you know, I generally will define public space as being outside of museums and galleries, but through this residency, there is this space in the museum that you're using. The museum is also technically a public space. So part of the question to figure out during the residency is how does this institutional space that is technically a public space, but that often seems not accessible to everyone, you know, what are the ways that I, as an artist, uh, can use it um, and potentially break down some of that or bring audiences into it that may not normally come into it? Um, you know, and ideally, because, you know, we're super idealistic, of course, you know, change the institution itself so that it's like that that's a change that permeates beyond just the time that I might be in residence or one of us might be in residence, but that it, you know, changes the institution as a whole later on. So I think it's like, yeah, we're all thinking about the interaction of these things in our projects. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that the... Sometimes it's hard to answer some of the questions for us in terms of the relationship to the public because of the, the focus of, of, of the project on the impulses of bodies and as stimuli and, and the engagement with others and with the objects and the space in, in sort of those terms. And I would also say that in, in the institution is a living, breathing organism in addition to the, you know, the performers and the object. I mean, it's all sort of dynamic in a particular way. And, and so I think there was a question around, about the, in, how does the working with an institution like the Wiseman change your process and efforts to engage with the public, benefits and barriers? And, and that's actually been really interesting for us because um, 
to even get here to get parking, to, you know, to be in the museum. These are, there, there are so many aspects of being in the space that are logistical, um, that, 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 can, that can get in the way and that are very real. And the other piece I would say is that um, because we are trying something, we are trying something that maybe we haven't tried before or um, where it's to totally new, that it takes time. Um, it takes time to engage in the space with people. Um, one time we had, I find that our project was probably most enjoyed by children. There was a three-year-old who kept coming back. Was, was it like, I don't know, an hour. an hour, and then would go and then come back for another hour. And, <laughs> and, and, and we finally let this child, like we were worried about the danger, but like start to touch things, <laughs> um, our objects, which could potentially be dangerous to other people. Um, but, but her engagement and, and was of depth. Right, so we didn't necessarily have an intended audience. We didn't know that a three-year-old would show up, right? I mean, we're in a university campus, and, and, I, and I think that um, we saw, uh, we were, we, it was really an experiment for us um, to try something that would come, come in with questions around the subject matter itself, and then to also be um, sort of in a public, continuous public rehearsal. Um, uh, as we discover. And the performance of that uh, sometimes was intense and sometimes, you know, was very closed in some ways um, because of how we engaged with each other um, within the space. And so, yes, the Wiseman did affect our process and it ha it, it's architectural, it's, you know, because where we're located within the building even, can they enter and exit a different door, like, like a lot of different things um, uh, mu like sort of uh, shape um, the public's experience of our work. Um, one time we were asked to talk to a whole bunch of people uh, about what we were doing right at the drop of a penny, right? Like it was like, oh, uh, can you tell us about your project? And there was like 10 people. And then like there was five of us in mid-conversation and we're like, Yes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so the, 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 and I know that this seems so, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, but, but yes, there was, there, there is a learning, there is a, there is time that it takes to learn the ways of the space that you're inhabiting and, and how people engage with it, which are varied. Um, and the institution absolutely has a role in that shape and, through physical space, through um, the way that people are invited in and out of the space, and also in terms of how we are invited within the space, and what are the set of rules, spoken or unspoken, um, that, that we engage with. And, and I think that that not only applies to the artist, but it also applies to the public, um, in terms of how their experiences are curated um, through the building in all these different ways. Can we go back to that top question because it's gotten a couple more votes and just see if anyone else is interested in, in answering that. When the public expresses critique of misrepresentation in public art projects, what's the role of artist versus institution and how is accountability balanced? <laughs> Are you going to answer that? Um, I wonder if someone can speak to this difference of accountability between artists and versus institution. <laughs> I'm not sure I can speak to that, but I feel like I feel like that's something. Like I have to say that in general, I feel like it's a question that there can't be one answer to, because so much of it has to do with the context in which the project's being created. And so, is this a project that the artist, um, you know, came up? With? I mean, also I feel like okay, like the subtext of this is clearly the Sam Durant scaffolding, right? I mean, this is the subtext of that question, you know. And so, in that case. You have a context of a project that already existed that was shown in one place that an institution decided to bring someplace else. And it's clear that the institution really wasn't thinking about this. And I would say that, you know, there's, in my opinion, in that case, 
there's more accountability that needs to be taken on account of the institution than the artist in that case. Because this was like, you know, the artist may not, the artist doesn't necessarily know and is relying upon that institution to give them the context of where that work is going to go. The artist can't necessarily always do all of that research for the context of where something's going to move to later. Um, but in general, yeah, I feel like it's very, like it's very case specific. You know, you don't know necessarily, um, you know, yeah, did the artist come up with this on their own? Is this coming from the museum commissioning something and then asking the artist to respond to something? So then is the artist taking the responsibility to do the research that they need to do in terms of coming up with a new work um, and questioning the relationship of the institution to that context, things like that? I mean, I think, you know, I'm not sure that this is even an answer to this question at this point. Um, but yeah, so maybe somebody else wants to take it from there. It looked like you were maybe going to say something, Petra. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe after that you answer that question. You, you too. Do you do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with Monica that it's really context dependent. But another question is here accountability to whom? Like, to whom do we answer? And there are ver like many publics or institutions that museum can answer. We can answer to the public that comes to the museum, or we can answer to the university, or we can answer to general uh, kind of art scene public. In case of the scaffolding, for example, I don't know, there's probably a lot of members of the public who didn't really care whose fault was that, Sam Duran or institution at all. Uh, but the institution, the walker was the face of it. Uh, if it's a professional art public, they will know who works in the institution, who was the director, and that's kind of on their imaginary CV for the rest of their lives. Um, and uh, the same goes for Sam Durand. So um, it really the question of who do we answer, and uh, I don't know. We have control over a lot of things, but sometimes in many of these questions we don't even have control over who we answer to. But we do have control over doing our own research, right? So, like, I would say that Sam Durand should have done some research to see where that was going. It was definitely, I, we're getting off topic, but it was, it was on both of them, I think. Um, because I as, as an artist, don't you want to make sure that your project is as successful as possible in the context in which it's being situated, not only geographical or physical site, but historically and culturally, right? Like it's not just being placed in a space or being um, um, performed in a space. There's a sort of historical and cultural arc that it situates itself within. And, and there's an amount of research that an institution and an artist would do to make sure it's, it's, they understand that place that it's being situated. Does that make sense? And yeah. Another interesting example to bring is the Tilted Arc. Uh, and, uh, well, I don't even remember what was the commission institution, but there was responsibility towards the public uh, that owned the square and used the square, and there was responsibility towards artists, that, which was kind of Richard Serrasso, this responsibility, uh, that he needed to protect the freedom of the artist to, uh, to do art. Uh, and that's, that's also a very complicated social structure to navigate. Should we go to another question? Um, how about, are there differences between reactions and responses, and how would you describe them? I'm not sure I understand that question. I think it was in response to us talking. I, uh, do you want to address it? I, I think you, do you want to? I feel like you're talking. I have a tangential, inconclusive comment. Um, <laughs> one of the... <laughs> One of the, one of the um, sort of dimensions of the research that, you know, I don't, I don't know what state this research really reached in our work, but um, over the course of the work, uh, we started to see the subject matter in terms of what it had to say about resilience and what might be, uh, uh, what, what we might find in common through, through using choreographic tools, tools in space what we might find in common between the resilience of individual bodies and the resilience of communities, for example. Um, in in our, our collective kind of reading about this, there was a paper, and unfortunately I can't cite it, um, 
but uh, the, the paper was presenting this kind of argument about uh, how do we shape our language about acknowledging resilience and do we see it as something that is ecological or something that is strategic on the part of an individual or a community? And uh, I, I, I'm not gonna share the conclusion that the paper came to and I, I don't think we synthesized a particular answer to that, but um, at least within the bubble of our work, I think there's a, you can kind of map that over to this reaction versus response question, um, if that makes any sense. I wanna give a chance to um, old-fashioned questions. Anyone? It seems that this works. This works question. better. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody starts thinking. How about effect on audience? Oh, wait, I saw it. Oh, did oh, someone over here? Steve raise his hand? Yeah. Did you raise your hand, Steve? I can. No, I can. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> no, maybe you were just stretching, sorry. <laughs> well, I have two. So I have two specific questions that I maybe I'll, I'll just throw them out there and then that are more about the particular work. And so, Nusheen, I, I, maybe I didn't quite hear you fully, but at one point when you were talking about the misrepresentation, you said something like my goal is not to represent, but, and I'm sure I got that wrong, but I'm wondering, I mean, I think it's a very interesting situation where you're going into St. James talking with illegal immigrant communities, you can't talk about them, but you are in some sense representing them. So I would love to hear a little bit more about that. And then as long as I have the mic, mm -hmm. I'm interested, Pramila and Max, um, how the two devices that you decided to create relate to this sort of, you know, what I think of as the, um, that instant, that moment of, recogni or of, of, in of introduction and especially the, the skateboard, which seems, I just, I don't quite understand, I'm interested in how those relate to the research, the specific objects. Uh, that was a really good question. Yeah, I exactly said that I didn't, my question wasn't to represent somebody else. Uh, so um, I have to explain a little bit more about the context of the radio in St. James to be able to, un uh, to um, unfold uh, the development of uh, that project. So in St. James, we didn't try to kind of like represent that community. Uh, instead, what we did was that we have an alarm system there that we worked with uh, LCLU, one of the people that uh, when the um, attack happens, people from that community, they call him to see if it's, like, if it's a rumor or not. So what we did is that like 5 a.m. in the morning, there's gonna be an alarm system that like explain that if the situation is red, basically like what should they do or what should they do, should, shouldn't do. And if the situation is yellow, which means that like there is a chance that that rumor might be true. Or if the situation is white, means that they can go to work, they can bring their kids to school. And that basically prevents some rumor that happens in uh, media that nobody has access to know if it's true or not. And because of that, there have been several families that because of the rumor, they just move from that city to another city. So that basically prevents some of those rumor that doesn't have any uh, truth in it. So and another part of the radio is some workshops that it's about right to know. Uh, basically, like if they have kids in their home, they should know that when somebody knocked the door, they shouldn't open the door because the moment that they open the door, even for like two inch, then the eyes can come in. So, like um, having workshops of like right to know or like having that alarm system, that's at least in my point of view, that's not any type of representation of that community, you know? And also, even in uh, university, we are developing that, we haven't broadcast it yet, but like for example, if the conversation happens around the Kaufman and then the change of the name and everything, we are not going to represent one side or the other side, we're gonna basically represent both sides. So we are just 
giving a, mm, yeah. Did I answer your question? Well, I, I think you did, but to put words in your mouth, it seems that then you're in some ways saying that you're taking a neutral position, which doesn't really seem believable. Um, well, okay, how come? Uh, neutral, neutral. Well, I think part of what you're saying is you're, you're amplifying an existing signal through your technology. And I'm not, I'm not arguing against the project. Mm -hmm. I think it's amazing, but you know, I think it doesn't quite deal with all the power dynamics of coming down from the Twin Cities, coming from the university. You know, saying, I mean, I just think there's a lot of interesting things, and I'm, it's interesting to, to, to hear you say, mm, we're just amplifying a signal, there's no representation going on. No, 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 okay, so I need to correct myself. The position that we are taking is exactly against what ICE is doing right now. So that's why we are having the, those signals. That's why... Uh, that's why it's not like on Facebook or something that like every, like basically it's on some radio frequency that people that they want to have access to that, they, they search for that, and that's exactly against what ICE is happening. And that's for basically, that's just a safety thing. Also, the uh, workshop of like r your right to know is a workshop that shows people to what to do when ICE happens to be like on their door and what card they can show, what is their right. So that's, that's my stand. Um, uh, there is the question of representation, um, Steve, I think is a very um, loaded question at the current time. Who gets to speak about or talk or even address the issue of an immigrant? Maybe an immigrant who is coming from like the arch enemy of United States uh, and lives in the United States as an artist, that person might, be, ha might have two more cents on what immigrants or immigration looks like. But in comparison, I mean, when we even compare our situation to, he, here is the problem of representation in a lot of cases. So we can talk about it, but we don't want to talk about the cases. But let's say a, a nine-year-old kid uh, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a southern border country uh, of United States, the, the gang or a cartel comes into their village and demands for the uh, every like the male to join this cartel and then when you don't if they don't do it they kill a part of that family and chop them and put them in a bag and place them in front of their door and when they say no they have to run away in this case this kid survived most of the family didn't. He made it all the way to uh, Mexico and U.S. border. He, he crossed the border and made it to s somewhere in southern Minnesota in, in St. James. The problem is this is how art reacts or how art talks about. An artist would die to kind of work on this and expand on it, even represent it or create a chance for this kid to talk about his case, versus when we, when we are in the setting of an immigration lawyer who's doing an amazing job, humanitarian job, to find what can be done legally to keep this people in the United States, you have to break it down as a volunteer to this kid that he cannot be accepted as an asylum seeker. So you are, as, an, as the artist, thinking about the right thing to do and the legal thing to do. And then that, might, that opened our eye in terms of we are not fooling ourselves. We are taking the side or we are like 
combining our force, even though it's little. We are artists, we are not politicians, we don't have money. The institutions, uh, they, it's not like a budget with hundreds of thousands of dollars to create an impact, but what we can do, we, we are all belonging or find ourselves or identifying ourselves with a group of, with a group in our public. And what we are trying to do, we are trying to balance that power through ways of creating conversation like this. But how deep we can go as artists is always depending on time. I wonder, Monique, how do you think about your role in the context of representation in your project? I mean, I think, um, like I often see myself as a facilitator and trying to facilitate uh, the participants representing themselves as much as possible, um, which of course, you know, brings into uh, question what the power dynamics are between me and the participants. Um, and in this case, um, one of the ways that I'm addressing that is that participants are getting paid for their work uh, in the project. So I think, I mean, I think, and I mean, I could be wrong, but I feel like, I mean, I feel like for me, it's this thing where it's like, yeah, it's like we're, like, I feel like we're trying, like we're trying to find ways that it's almost not representation, that like you're almost working as like a medium or a conduit, which of course is impossible. You know, I mean, you are always there and you're always in that sense. Um, and of course, like, and, you know, if you are ever, um, you know, anytime something is in a different form than it was originally, that's mediation of it, you know, and so that's changing the form of it and somehow that's, you know, there's some shift that's taking place there. Um, and so I feel like there's a way in which, you know, the projects that we're working on, you know, we're coming from this social documentary impulse, but then trying to avoid the pitfalls that plague social documentary, whether it's photo or, you know, film or whatever. And so we're trying to find other ways where it's like, you know, that, that, that the mediating role of the artist is as tiny as possible, you know? And I think that that's part of, I mean, at least for me, I think that is part of what drives it in a way, is like almost, you know, I mean, like there is certainly, like it's not self-sacrificing in the sense of like, I'm trying to erase myself from the work because I'm, you know, some great, wonderful person or whatever, but, you know, that it's like, how can I use the access that I have as an artist and the kind of space that I can create as an artist um, to present a story that may not get presented otherwise? Um, and so, and in doing that, yeah, how do I do as little harm as possible? And how do I, um, you know, like, how do I, yeah, I mean, how do I basically help people to present the story that they want to present rather than the story that I might want to present? I don't know if that answers your question either. <laughs> I really want to hear someone answering the first question at the top now. How does working with institutions such as the Wiseman change your process and efforts to engage public? What are benefits or and barriers? I think this is probably the last question that we have time for. So if, if, any, if you all want to just give a brief answer to that or if a couple of you want to wanna weigh in on that. Yeah, okay. So I have a short, quest, a short answer. I just feel it's completely different because when you do a project in the public, in the street, you come across people who have different like, things in their mind. They're going home, what they're, they're thinking what they buy in grocery, what dinner they're gonna make, maybe. But when you are interacting with the audience, like in the museum, they came here after dinner, they expect something completely different. That's a, like an example of how different group you're working with. 
And then especially when you create an event that uh, is participatory, you are interacting with audience, you diff completely different thing can happen. You can design different flow. You can have a, uh, invite them to do different things. Um, recently, I saw a book. There is a really cool, interesting like quote in it. They say, uh, can't remember. So they say like uh, when uh, when the audience come to museum or gallery, they basically um, like kind of uh, surrender themselves and admit that they can be the victim of art. <laughs> So it's like gives the assumption that you can do anything to them. They, by entering the space, they already give themselves out to you. They want to experience, experience something. Their mind is ready and open for something crazy you want to give them. But on the street, it's different. On the street, they are not expecting anything. So their mind also in a really interesting, like vulnerable state, you actually also can take advantage of in a different, with a different strategy, strategies. Um, that's what I recently realized. So that's my experience. Any other thoughts on the presentation? Yeah. 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 I've already answered that question. I mean, I'll just say quickly that I think um, this is really the first time I've done a project within an institution. And so for me, it's really something that I'm still navigating and trying to figure out how it's different. Um, because, you know, I mean, on one hand, um, in the context of this project, particularly working with a group that, um, you know, generally does not get a lot of respect um, and whose concerns about their labor also often are dismissed. Uh, the institution provides this legitimizing platform for us, and that's really useful. Um, and that's something that definitely, you know, we want to take advantage of in the process. But what it actually means to work within an institution and the relationships that you have within that, and then the sort of um, responsibilities you have, it's totally different than doing a project totally on your own, which my previous project was really just, you know, only beholden to me and the participants. So now there's kind of this third party in there and trying to figure out how that works. Um, and I mean, yeah, Pramila already talked about some of the, you know, there's logistical things that are, are um, you know, barriers or challenges or however you want to put it. Um, but then, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's learning how to navigate that um, and learning how to, you know, figure out if the institution is the best place to continue to do that project as well. I think we'll end on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to all of our artists. Thank you. Hello. Thank you all so much for being here. There should be food already over there, and there will be music soon over there. See you around.